Good morning. Uh, this is Sunday, April 19th. It's been a month now since Family Bible Church has been able to meet together for worship and fellowship together. Um, but we'll look forward to the day when we can do that once again. How are you doing? There's a lot going on. And now we hear in the news about people protesting and uh, their anxiety getting the best of them. Uh, I trust <clears throat> as Christians and those who truly trust in the Lord uh, that you haven't reached that point. Uh, if you have, perhaps today's message will help you as well because uh, it's a normal thing for us to be overwhelmed, for us to be anxious. Uh, but Scripture has a lot to say uh, what we should do with that and uh, how we can be overcomers. So we want to look at that again, um, as many probably are, uh, to try and help us to really focus. Uh, because the, this is a time in which uh, the rubber meets the road, if you will. Um, <clears throat> we talk a lot about faith. We talk a lot about trusting God no matter what. And then we go open our refrigerator and uh, take out our daily food uh, after we've prayed, Father, give us this day our daily bread. Um, and we don't really have to trust him uh, until the chips are down, until the paycheck's not there, until uh, there's uh, trouble in our life when uh, we have no recourse, no ability to change it, no ability of our own to make it better. Uh, then the uh, rubber meets the road in a sense that um, we have to put our faith into action. And uh, sometimes we feel like we need to tie a knot in the end of the rope because we're at the end of our patience, we're at the end of our wits. And um, so we do. We tie a knot in the end of the rope and we hang on to Jesus. We hang on to our faith, the one that we know will bring us through. So let me have a word of prayer with us. Lord, I pray uh, that as we just look at your word for a few moments today, that that which seems familiar and sounds familiar would have a whole different uh, depth of meaning and understanding given the present times in which we live. And that, Lord, we would make uh, strong application of it to our own hearts. Encourage your people. Encourage those that don't know you to come to invite you into their life, that they might know your peace. And may we who know you be an example of how that can be lived out and played out in our life uh, in today's world. Lord, I pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> There are three or four passages of Scripture that I want to use today, um, but uh, the title that comes to mind would be, Is God Big Enough? And then to make it personal, is your God big enough? We could answer the question, yes, God is big enough. God is creator of all things and over all things. But when it comes right down to you, when it comes right down to your faith and uh, your application of what you understand about God, is your God big enough? There's a passage in uh, Luke chapter 12. Uh, if you want to jot that down, turn to it later, or if you have your Bibles, you can turn there now. Luke chapter 12, where Jesus is speaking in red letters to his disciples and gives this illustration of a rich landowner who has great success with his gardens and his uh, produce, so much so that it overfills his barns and he has more than he needs to store and doesn't have room for it. And rather than being generous and giving it away, he says, I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I can sit back and say, relax, and 
uh, be at peace because you have provided for yourself. Well, <laughs> God's not a God that wants to share uh, the glory of what he does with, with us in the sense that he wants to get the glory. He wants the credit um, for all that he accomplishes. And when God brings about great uh, success from the land and produce, uh, it's probably so we could share it, not hoard it. So anyway, the Lord says to him, thou fool, after he has stored up all these things and gone through the great expense of building new barns, this very day your life is required of you. In other words, you you don't realize the length of your days. None of us do. And we don't know just how long we have and when uh, death will come. And so death came to that rich landowner. And then the Lord says, now who will all of these things belong to? You see, um, he couldn't take it with him, and neither can we. But the story goes on in Luke 12, um, picking up the end of that with uh, verse 19, where he says, uh, the landowner says, I'll say to my soul, <laughs> to my soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So, verse 21 says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Keep that phrase in mind. Rich toward God. That has a sense of uh, setting a priority. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Then it goes on and talks about not being anxious. He said to his disciples, Jesus, in red letters now, um, this isn't just a story uh, to be read. This is words of Jesus to our soul, to our heart. He says to his disciples, not just the 12, not just the apostles, but uh, to all of those that were following after him. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. <laughs> Does that fit? Today or not, there's so much anxiety, so much turmoil. And I, I get emotional because people are lost. They don't, they don't know where their strength lies. And as believers, it puts us to the test. Where does our strength lie? I trust that you know where to dig in and how to really trust and find peace in the midst of it. Not, not trust and hope and maybe so, kind of trust, but one that brings you a satisfaction that God has got this, and it will bring you peace, absolutely will. Therefore, do not, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, about your body, what you'll put on, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Verse 24, consider the ravens, consider the birds. They neither sow nor reap. They neither have storehouses or barns, and yet God feeds them. And now the important question of how much more value are you than these? Of how much more value are you than birds? Now, some, in the midst of their despair, in the midst of their uh, insecurity, might say, I'm worth nothing. A bird is worth more than I am. It's not true. It's not so. God created you with his hands 
as it were, in the Garden of Eden, God created man and woman, and he breathed into us, which he did not do with any animal or bird. He breathed into us his very life, the breath of life, his spirit. And uh, you are of more value than they. He came and gave his life on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, not for any bird or any animal. Um, keep that in mind. The soul of man is of great worth and great value to God that he would give his son to redeem it, to redeem you. Is not your life of more value than the birds? And yet they're fed. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? Or in other words, by being anxious, can you change the events of today? Does it help you? <laughs> Does it help you sleep at night when you get all anxious or worried? Um, no, it doesn't. And I'm not belittling, the, I don't mean to belittle the fact that uh, we can get overwhelmed by it. Um, it is very real. But this scripture talks about not letting that happen. Do not be anxious about your life. Trust God. Consider the lilies of the field. Uh, we've got some daffodils out here that are just uh, ready to pop open. The buds are full. And by the way, if you have dogs, uh, we've just discovered that uh, it's very poisonous <laughs> for a dog to chew on daffodils, azaleas, uh, and things like that. So don't let them do it. But consider the beauty of the daffodils. Consider the beauty of the lilies. Uh, I trust maybe some of you got an Easter lily this past Easter uh, to have in your home. Uh, beautiful. They smell wonderful. Consider them, how they grow and how they neither toil nor spin nor fret. Uh, Yet I tell you, even Solomon, all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field and has created such beauty uh, for us, which is here today and gone tomorrow, so to speak, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? How much more will he take care of you, provide for you, Look out for you. Bring you through. Because you are of much more value. Verse 30 says, For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows you have need of them. Verse 31, which goes along with Matthew 6, 33. But we're in Luke 12, 31. Instead, of the anxiety instead of the worry, instead of the focus on what we can't control. Seek his kingdom first, and these things will be added to you. God's kingdom has to do with the things that God is in control over. Uh, you think of a king who has a kingdom. Uh, the kingdom is under his authority and under his control. And it's his realm uh, of uh, conducting business, if you will. Seek first the kingdom of God, his realm. It's a spiritual thing. It's not in this life, in this world anyway, it's not so much physical <clears throat> in that the kingdom of God here is spiritual. And as believers in Christ, we're connected to the kingdom of God by faith because his Holy Spirit has come to live within us. That realm of the Spirit, we are part of the kingdom of God. Seek first that realm of the Spirit. Seek first the kingdom of God and his ways, his righteousness. And all the other things that he already knows you have need of, 
he'll take care of. That's why we're to cast all of our care, all of our concern upon him because he cares for us. We've got to let that sink in sometimes. We, we know that phrase. We hear it. Um, we can recite it. But we're to cast all of our care on him because he cares for you. He cares about your anxiety. He cares about your worry. He cares about your situation. He cares about your finances. Here's a, here's a phrase or a paragraph that I found that was listed in a blog, uh, copyrighted and, and entitled Soul Shepherding Blog. So I give credit to this Soul Shepherding Blog for this paragraph. Anxiety is considered a secondary emotion because we only feel anxious when we have unwanted emotions like fear, anger, shame, or sadness, things that we're trying to get rid of. In other words, anxiety is a control problem. When you or I are anxious, it's because we're trying to control things. How we feel, what people think of us, or the outcomes of situations in our lives. And when we can't control them, guess what happens? We become anxious. He continues in this blog, people who are anxious usually feel that they shouldn't be anxious, especially as believers. We know we should cast all our care upon him. We know that uh, we should not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and petition uh, to present these requests to God with thanksgiving and that the peace of God then will take control. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. Where was I? <laughs> People who feel anxious uh, feel that they shouldn't be anxious. They're upset at themselves for feeling like they do, feeling weak or needing help to overcome this. They're convinced that if they try harder, things will get better. But trying harder rarely makes things better. We need to learn to try differently try differently, to train to become the kind of person who can rely on care from God, rely on care from God and others, and submit to God in all things, and therefore be at peace. Submit to God in all things, and therefore be at peace in Him in who he is, in your God being big enough. We know God is big enough. And I believe your God is too. Philippians chapter 4 is a familiar passage in these times that we read about that I made reference to, not being anxious about anything. Uh, Philippians 4, 6. But I just want to capitalize on verse 7 that uh, we don't often give as much focus to as we do verse 6. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God which surpasses understanding. We think we understand things. We understand what the news media feeds us. Well, we, we need something that's going to supersede that in order to find peace. Well, here you go. Cast all your cares upon him. Do not be anxious, but give it to him in prayer and petition with thanksgiving that he's got it, with thanksgiving that he's in charge, and you can trust him. Be thankful. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, no one else will be able to understand it or figure it out how you came to that place, unless you tell them and explain to them. And 
The peace of God will guard your heart and mind. We need that. We need our hearts and especially our minds to not run with the way of the world, run with the confusion of the world or the troubles of the world. Um, and I've got to say, don't saturate yourself with it. Uh, turn the TV off. Turn the news off. Turn on the gospel music. I've said it before uh, and I'll say it again. It's been a, a, a very important part of our lives to have uh, Christian music playing in the background during the day. Uh, even as we raised our kids, they grew up being fed the Word of God through uh, children's music, whether it was Salty, the singing songbook, or the Donut Man, or other child uh, scripture songs. Um, we played those and played those and played those and, uh, and then continued to play worship songs and just things that are uplifting. Uh, it'll, it'll really make a difference. Honest. Driving in the car. There's all kinds of selections on the radio, all kinds of stuff that you may have grown up with in the world for artists and things that are familiar that uh, you enjoy. But I'm telling you, feed your soul with the things of God. Feed your soul with uh, music that has words that bring your attention to worship and praise of your God and your Creator. You see, that's the thing that's eternal. The things of this world are temporary. Let's get our minds straight. Let's get our hearts focused on Him in all that we do. That's what the Word of God instructs us in all that we do. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. And then down in verse 9 of Philippians chapter 4 still, verse 9, uh, skipping over the, some of those things, you can read them yourself, uh, where it says, finally, brothers, to fo think on these things, whatever is true, honorable, whatever is just, pure, lovely, think on these things. We need to do that as well. But then it says at the very end of verse 9, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Practice. We know what practice means. Anybody who's become accomplished at something, no matter what it is, whether it's music uh, or an instrument or track and field or, or sports of any kind, whatever it is we become accomplished at, even in business, it takes effort, it takes intentionality, and it takes practice. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Third John. Third John 1, or actually 2 and 3. John is speaking to his friend Gaius. And he's speaking from his heart. These words that I think have a lot of meaning, even for us. He says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health, and that it may go well with you, even as your soul prospers. Is your soul prospering? John could say that to his friend. I pray that you would be in good health and that it all may go well with you. Because this man's soul was prospering. He was growing in the knowledge of God. You see, sometimes I think we reach a plateau as believers where we have grown to a point, we, we know God's Word, we've read it, we've heard, you know, Bible studies and Sunday school lessons and, and sermons, and we feel like we're a good Christian because we believe God and we say we trust Him. Well, now's the time to really put it to the test. Now's the time to really grow up in the gospel, to grow up in the word of God and in Christ and put it to work. May you be in good health and may all go well with you even as your soul prospers or as your soul is getting along well, the NIV says. So work on your soul. Feed your soul. And the question there is, what are you feeding your soul? 
if you were to weigh it in a balance, the things of the day as seen on television or the things of God in his word and in Christian music input, weigh, weigh that in your life. What, what is feeding you most? Only you can answer that. And it will give you an answer, I believe, to handling your anxiety. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2, actually 2 through 8. I may not read all of it in the interest of time. First Peter 1, 2, he opens by saying, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. We need it. In the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where our minds need to be. That's where our focus needs to be. And the grace and peace of God will be multiplied to you. And it goes on in verse 3. His divine power, God Almighty, as, uh, and all of his divine power, just sila, <laughs> scripture says, uh, in various places, to ponder, to stop and think about that. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's available. He's made it available to you through his divine power.